the entire uh, southern Afghanistan is one big IED. And every time a soldier goes outside the wire, drives down the road, walks across a great field, he or she is being placed in danger. On our walk back, uh, we, had, um, we had two guys in front, myself with a gator, and then two guys in the rear. Walking back, everything's normal. We're less than 100 meters away from, uh, from our cob at the school. Um, <clears throat> we're walking, walking, uh, look directly ahead, and then all of a sudden, boom, contact ID went off. ID, RPG went out short. Here we go. Go back, grab uh, two more guys at least. My brain bucket out of my room. It's far side of my cotton, and we'll go investigate. Doc! Doc! My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mike Vernon. I'm an Army Reservist from Calgary, and this is my first combat patrol. But I've been to Afghanistan before, eight years ago, when I was a video journalist with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The situation was very different back then. I decided to return because I want to see all the changes firsthand, as a soldier. Do you want me in the order of march? We're just gonna put you right in front of uh... So this time, I'm wearing a uniform and carrying a rifle, as well as my camera gear. Give, give me about five, uh, give me about 10 meters. Okay. Yep. The temperature is above 40 Celsius, and everyone is carrying at least 25 kilograms of gear. This patrol is taking me into the heart of Nakone, Taliban country. It's one of the deadliest places in Kandahar province. You can see where soldiers have knocked down sections of mud brick walls to make themselves less vulnerable to attack. Eight Canadian soldiers have been killed here in the past year, mostly by improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. We had three IED fines and two strikes in this corner here. Injured the interpreter and killed that patrol here. The military calls this Route Chimo, it's only about a kilometer long, but it's the main road through this pro-Taliban village of about 3,000 people. Southern Afghanistan has long been one of the most volatile regions in the country. Taliban insurgents infiltrate Kandahar city by approaching it from the direction of Nakone. To gain control of the village, soldiers have built two combat outposts, or COPs. There's one at either end, COP Patricia and COP Balpeen. To help secure the road between them, a third outpost has just been added in the middle of the village. It's called Cop Lion. This lion here? Yeah. This is Combat Outpost Lion. Some people say it used to be a school, and that's what they still call it, the girls' school. Now it's home for a Canadian infantry platoon and a company of soldiers from the ANA, or Afghan National Army. About 100 people in all. I've come to learn more about the small team of soldiers who help improve how the Afghans and Canadians work together. There are nine of them. They're called the Operational Mentor and Liaison Team, the OMLT, better known as the Omelette. The Omelette's here to professionalize the Afghan National Army, making better than what they are, um, teaching them to synchronize complex operations, uh, and reach right down and train them on low-level tactical uh, type, uh, type skills. Everything is a and driven here. That's why we're here. That's our mission. So it's not about us. It's about them. Same thing. There are Omelette by. teams deployed throughout Kandahar province. Captain Pete Reinches is the officer in charge of the omelette at Cop Lion. Back home in London, he's a constable with the Ontario Provincial Police. Although he's served overseas in Bosnia, this is his first tour in Afghanistan. He says his mission here is straightforward, to hold Nakone. And then our submission 
for the omelet is to enable the ANA to perform their tasks by bringing uh, airstrikes, artillery, engineering assets, any other assets that they don't have the capability to uh, to call to uh, to fire, and uh, uh, we mentor them. Although this team here, this company here, is teaching us a lot. Um, and we just partner with them, we live with them, we work with them, bond with them, and, and carry out the mission. He's enthusiastic because his team is finally getting to do what they trained for, mentoring Afghans at the grassroots company level. When they first arrived in country, Canadians were no longer doing this. It was viewed by some as being too dangerous. That decision was recently reversed. I would say this is probably the most enriching experience I've had in my life to date, is working with these guys. His second in command is another part-time soldier who's also volunteered to serve here. Master Warrant Officer Daryl Chambers helps manage a security company in Brantford. And I just hang that up on the wall. Currently, we're standing in uh, Strong Point uh, Lion. Behind me, we have uh, the working well. The ANA have uh, been using nonstop for the last 24 hours. They use it for everything from cooking, to cleaning their clothes, and personal ablutions as well. Uh, there are Ford Rangers with their weapon systems on top. And of course, their sleeping quarters in the very background. Down here we have uh, the living quarters for both the omelet team and call sign 4-1. It's fairly tight quarters down here. Eating, sleeping and socializing are all done uh, within the compound walls. In here we have uh, our ablutions area, it's an improvised shower system, improvised uh, toilets and a uh, grey water pit. The well water we get from the ANA is used for pretty much everything in the camp other than cooking and drinking. As you can see, uh, it's also used uh, to do individual laundry. Down here, is our burn pit. Currently we have an issue with the health concerns of our garbage, so we're trying different methods of burning. Uh, currently we're burning as uh, we see fit. We get enough garbage in there, we burn it. We're gonna limit that to a once or twice a week burn where we will saturate uh, the garbage and then light it a fire. <laughs> now kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> Workers' comp claim right here. Well, I'm just a witness. I want to fill it out. The omelet soldiers have been here for nearly two weeks preparing the camp. The other 100 soldiers just arrived, and there's still plenty of work to do between patrolling the village and making their compound more defensible. A screen, a screen, a wonderful thing. Everyone knows it's Link. Because the compound is in the center of the village, there's very little standoff room. At first, insurgents could potentially get right up to the walls before launching an attack. Watch your legs, sir. Good, eh? Not that many. Oh, I'll just bring that over, Rich. We'll split it. Okay. Oh, this is going to be bad for you. The other Canadians in the camp belong to an infantry platoon from the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Canadian Regiment, based in Gagetown, New Brunswick. Lieutenant yeah, Derek McDonald is the platoon commander. All that. Oh. <laughs> oh. You're lucky I got you covered, sir. <laughs> okay, sir, we should switch ranks now. Our mission that was given from our hire was to dominate uh, Routimo. We decided that we would uh, do small patrols and just launch every 15 to 30 minutes, mixing timings up, and uh, dominate it in that aspect. 4 2, this is 4 2 Lima. Say again, your message is broken over. The roads are not suitable for even light armored vehicles, so soldiers patrol Route Chimo on foot, exerting their presence every day around the clock. Let's do it. Let's go to Patricia. 42 Alpha, correction, 72 Alpha is 42, starting the location. Every time they leave the front gate, patrols pass a local landmark, a large field of marijuana plants. 
It's a fairly common, but nevertheless amusing sight. Essential items and goodies can only come strapped on the back of a gator and its trailer. Mail is infrequent, and today it's virtually all for one man in the omelet. <laughs> so who's the mail for? Uh, Captain uh, Pete Wrenches. He has like five boxes right now. Box number one. Huh. Yeah, wrenches Captain Wrenches. All, stuff. Yeah. all 20 of them. Captain Wrenches. Yeah, seriously, the whole mail boxes. Captain Wrenches. Captain Wrenches. Captain Wrenches. Captain Wrenches. Oh, that's for you, Dar. Oh, sweet. Captain Wrenches. Captain Wrenches and one for me. Why does he get so much mail? That's a good question. Ask the Sergeant Major. He's a loving individual. <laughs> oh, for him. There's also only one generator and one refrigerator for the camp. And there's a problem. Second thing, the fridge, it's kaput. It's, it's done. Shouldn't have one anywhere we're at war. <laughs> <laughs> having, having said that, we shouldn't get eight boxes of mail per yeah. soldier either. <laughs> It's going all the way to Soldier. They won't know anything about it. Okay, I'll let you know. The fridge will get replaced, but in the meantime, soldiers make do by buying blocks of ice from shopkeepers in the village. For a small delivery charge, local children will wheel it straight to the front gate of the camp. What'd you pay for the ice and, and what's that in Canadian? Uh, 600 Afghani. It was probably about $14. It's worth it? It's worth it on a day like this. At first, the Afghans and Canadians maintain a cautious distance from each other. They're in the same compound, but sleep and eat separately. That will gradually change as they work together in the coming days. Soldiers deployed in combat outposts tend to live and fight under harsher conditions than most other Canadian soldiers. They need to be self-reliant and independent. And because they are working with soldiers from another culture, there's one more very important quality required. Patience. We can teach an armored soldier certain skills that he or she needs to pass on, but they need to be patient uh, because uh, there will be a lot of challenges out there. Uh, a lot of things that, uh, cultural things that they'll have to deal with that uh, they're not used to. A lot of demands placed on them from um, higher headquarters, um, demands that they need to meet uh, back home with their own family and things of this nature. And of course, demands that I'm gonna place, uh, place on them. That can mean showing some restraint when it comes to talking with an Afghan soldier about how to be a sentry. Where's your weapon? Go weapon. It's coming. Okay, you should show up with it. What are? Hey? What's his name? My name is Mike. What is your name? Mike? Yeah. Mike? Yeah. My name is Hamid. Hamid? Hamid. Nice to meet you, Hamid. Where is your weapon? Weapon? Yeah, where is your weapon? Okay. When you are on gate, you bring weapon. Go weapon. Go get your gun. This is the frustrating part. <laughs> Many of these Afghan soldiers have extensive combat experience in Helmand and Urzgan, working alongside the British, Dutch, and Americans. But they have a low tolerance for garrison routine. Captain Reinches is particularly impressed, however, with his opposite number, the company commander, Lieutenant Zubir. The commander is 23, he graduated in Kabul as an engineer. He comes from a small town in northern Afghanistan, and he's telling me that his town killed over 2,000 um, Taliban when the Taliban came to his, his town. And there were a lot of experienced um, uh, Mujahideen fighters in his town, and, and he was just, we sat down for an hour, and he told me about the ambushes that they laid for the Taliban and all the tactics they used. And, you know, I was very impressed. And they're very clever. Some of them very complex, some of them very simple but effective. Uruzgan Elman. Elman. Marja. Oh, Marja. Oh, Helmand. Canadians offer specialized skills and training. 
Sergeant Ed Wadley is a combat engineer at nearby cop Patricia. Bad place. His detachment is very busy and keeps a running record of all the IEDs, suspected IEDs, and explosive ordnance they've encountered in the past three months. Combat engineers are in high demand, but they can't be everywhere at once. So they train ANA infantry soldiers to protect themselves against mines and IEDs. The number one thing is how to avoid and how to predict where uh, IEDs can be in place and how to avoid those areas, and then how to, uh, without any additional risk, how to confirm that the IED is there. If he had first found this... This includes showing them how to prod for mines and pressure plates, using the utmost care to locate explosives even though this task is usually done by specialists. He, this is not safe. He cannot move from where he is until he finds the pressure plate. Sergeant Wadley also talks to them about the ingenuity of the bombers. It's important knowledge to have because Afghan and Canadian patrols stick to the main road through Nikone, which makes them somewhat predictable and vulnerable. And what they've done a lot of times too is they'll put one IED to hurt us, and then as we try to get the injured man to safety, they'll put another IED. So I'll show them the other By continuously patrolling one route through the village, the soldiers here aim to deny the Taliban the time they need to emplace more IEDs in their path. Lately, it seems to be working. Once we've cleared the, knocked the walls down and just doubled the presence in town itself, we haven't had a single IED in the town itself. But uh, there are ones on the outskirts because the, the insurgents have lost all their influence in the town. Ideally, all patrols are partnered. That is, a mix of Canadian and Afghan soldiers. But this isn't always the case. And sometimes Afghans and Canadians seem to operate on different clocks. Sergeant, you good? Let's go. All ready for you. Uh, we're going to be on TV. We're going to be famous. We're going to be famous. We're going to be famous. I'm not going. When they aren't patrolling, leaders like Lieutenant Zabir run short teaching sessions. This mentoring lesson is about the correct use of parachute flares. It's timely since an ANA soldier recently fired one across the compound. But this particular lesson proves harder to teach than expected. I read the instructions. It's just stuck. Okay, there we go. There we go, right there. Don't this. Who fired it yesterday? Show us how you did it. <laughs> Well, let's see, turn it. <laughs> Stuck. This one's broken. I think it's yes. Oh, 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 oh. Maybe. No, this one's broken. Oh. This one's already ready to go, it's already down. Yeah. See, it's supposed to be up. This was already down, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. You know what this is called? Not all the mentoring is formal. When soldiers take turns manning the simple command post, there's occasionally time to work on their language skills or cultural awareness in general. Do you know what she's uh, standing on? This? This right here. Train tracks. Train railroad. Track. Railroad track. Train, okay. Language is perhaps the biggest obstacle to comradeship. Most of the ANA are from northern Afghanistan and speak Dari. People in the Kone speak Pashto, and few Canadians speak either. So Corporal Kashif Dar has an advantage over his peers. I was born in Pakistan, so I speak Urdu and Punjabi. 
Over the past three decades, many Afghans learned these languages while they were living in refugee camps in Pakistan. Most of them towards me, they were a bit astonished, like the Sergeant Major, the Commander, most of the soldiers, because um, I'm the first Pakistani that they've, uh, that they've encountered within Canadians. Uh, usually they just have interpreters that they talk to, but um, they, were pretty, uh, they were pretty happy to know that, uh, that I speak Urdu and that I'm relatively from the same culture. So a lot of them come to me with their problems, but uh, towards other Canadians they like. Uh, a lot of them say they're like, I don't want to work with any other army because they like the way we do things and just overall how things work with us. Leaders and soldiers rely on interpreters called language assistants to help them understand one another. But they vary greatly in quality, so sometimes communicating comes down to drawing diagrams in the dirt. We're here. Yeah. Patricia. Yeah. Shoja. Yeah. Shakir. Shakir. Fight. Taliban. Yeah, Taliban. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So we go to Patricia, yeah. and we wait until the fight is over. Then we go to Shoja. In spite of such difficulties, there is a general level of respect and trust. Canadians trust the Afghans, for example, to handle camp security, even though some sentries have a habit of talking on their cell phones when they're on duty. I've been on some of the OPs with them at night, and I feel completely secure. <laughs> yeah, uh, they watch this place like a hawk. It's, it's quite impressive, actually. I, I have no problem just sleeping at night knowing that they got my back. To make the sentry's job even easier, the Canadians will loan them this night observation device. This is our Nodler, uh, and it's for uh, thermal vision. Um, we're going to set it up in OP so we have a better eyes over the, uh, the area that we're observing. Uh, we should be able to see a lot better at night. It's pretty simple to set up and, and to operate once it's running. Once we get them running, it shouldn't be an issue. All they got to do is look and scan. Some soldiers exchange uniform patches as a sign of comradeship. Uh, the patch on my shoulder is uh, for the uh, ANA 205th Rifle Brigade. It was given to me by one of the medical officers and uh, it was because I was liaisoning with him to uh, to help him get their medical stuff set up when I first got here. So that's why I, I wear it. We're not supposed to, but I do. With the Afghans, they, they actually like it. It's a conversation starter for them. Uh, they seem to relate to me a little bit better because it gives that, that kind of camaraderie between the two that I'm wearing their patches. And if it was up to him, Captain Reinches would keep his beard. Uh, the beard culturally here is a sign of, of respect and status. And if you have a gray beard, it gives you even more respect. And because it shows age and wisdom, uh, my beard happens to actually come in like shaving cream white. Um, the issue is headquarters I turned up the other day. I haven't had a shower in 12 days. Uh, change of clothes 12 days. And of course, I stopped shaving maybe seven or eight days ago. And so they, uh, the new incoming uh, commander was upset about my uh, beard. And uh, so my sergeant major was told on the side to make sure that I remove it. When I was talking to him, he made it very clear The rules are different for this visiting American major. He's got a beard and he speaks Dari. He's here to assess how well the Canadians and Afghans grasp and employ the latest counterinsurgency doctrine. He's already had a run-in with the ANA company's second-in-command, Lieutenant Gull, the first sign of friction between the Afghans and their mentors. I didn't really understand what he was saying. I thought he was being just snobbish to me. So I said, all right, enough. That's why I, I, that's why I pulled him outside. I said, let's go outside. I asked him, I said, do you got a problem with me? Flat out, I said, do you have a problem with me? He said, no, 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 no. I said, okay, well, look, man, I, I, I report directly to the Corps commander out here. And I'm a major and you're a lieutenant. And I'm here to be your friends. But if you got a problem with me, you need to come talk to me about it. Because right now, this ain't cool. But we can work around I don't that. like him too much. If he was one of my lieutenants, I'd crush him a little bit. Yeah, he's, he's dangerous, I think. Yeah. And he's, he's looking for the LT to mess up, the EOC to mess up. He's waiting. There's another source of tension in the compound. Some Canadian soldiers' lack of modesty. 
When it's so hot, they think nothing of walking around the all-male camp in their boots and underwear. That's going too far, according to Afghan culture. Very private. Uh, they'll wash fully dressed under the well water, right there in the center. Just get in uniform, go under there and wash. Or they'll go in private and uh, bathe as we would back home. So did anyone speak to you about this issue, about naked dudes walking around? Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that uh, as part of it. If you're outside these gates, right outside this door, everything beyond that is clothing on. In here, same policy, clothing optional. All right? And I'm not happy about it, but that's the way you have it. Some soldiers resent the new policy, especially because they don't always understand the Afghans' own customs, especially displays of affection between male soldiers. As a Canadian, I find some of this, some of the stuff that goes on here that the Afghans have as, as sort of a cultural norm a little offensive myself. Checking the rocks, uh, the rocks at the kids, that's a big one, you know, if they don't want the kids around. Bringing the, the live animals in to, uh, to uh, cut up and eat, you know, I mean, I don't know, find that offensive, I guess. It's a little uh, I don't know, primitive. But, uh, you know, just sort of stuff like that, like uh, the, the sergeant major slapping his guys around, stuff like that, things, things we wouldn't put up with uh, at all, things that wouldn't be allowed, you know, that they shouldn't be allowed. And you just sort of watch it, and you have to stand back and let it happen. One thing they have in common, however, is a love of fresh food. Most days, Canadians eat army rations because of the lack of refrigeration. When they get some frozen ribs to barbecue, it's a feast. Conversely, while there is a stock of halal rations for the Afghans, they prefer to eat fresh food, even if it is pretty much the same staples every day. They're also generous when it comes to inviting Canadians to share it with them. They share what they have, you know, what they have to share. Some of the meals are pretty good. Some of their rations are pretty good. Their food is far better than ours. The meals I'm invited to here are, are terrific. The fresh meat is, is fantastic, and you know, you, the meat is very fresh here. And uh, the bread, vegetables, everything is fantastic. So it's, it's a nice treat for me to be invited for dinner with them. In fact, Reinches would like to be even closer to the Afghans. He's seriously considering moving in with Lieutenant Zubir and his men. We actually truly like each other. I think we get along that way. I'm quite a bit older than he is, but he's got a lot of experience and he's very mature for his age. And you know, we've, we talk a lot and we've bonded that way. And uh, so he asked that I would move in with them and live with them. And to me, that's the ultimate success in, in the, for an AMA position is to be invited to live with them, right with them, not segregated. So I will be moving my kit this evening and taking up uh, residence right with the ANA command cell. And now I'll spend the rest of my days in that location. But this is where he and his sergeant major differ, and not for the first or last time. Uh, my advice to him was no. Uh, it wasn't really advice as much as it was no. Nobody works 24-7. When you get a firefighter that works uh, at the fire hall all the time. He goes home after uh, his shift's done, right? Everybody goes home at the end of their shift. The troops need a place to go home and relax, unwind, somewhere where they can talk to themselves, talk, or talk to each other, and, uh, you know, air vent, grieve, and then soldier on in the morning. Right. No, my other Rockies are perfect. These boots are junk. And then these, I never wore these. The omelet soldiers are split, like children caught in a custody battle between <laughs> dad, mom and dad. Dad? With dad and mom. Yeah. Dad, the, uh, I don't know. Dad's the officer, uh, mom's okay. the sergeant major. Cool. Yeah, but I'm with mom. You're with mom? You're with mom? Uh, I don't pick sides between mom and dad. Well, no, <laughs> if, if you had to pick sides between mom and dad, we just can't put you in. <laughs> getting, uh, if they were getting a divorce right now. <laughs> God, reliving my parents' divorce. <laughs> <laughs> what you yeah, doing? I'd probably pick mom. You pick mom? Yeah. I'm on dad's side. Dad. We are going the issue has come up before, with omelet soldiers wanting to live and work more closely with the ANA. Ultimately, the commander of the omelet sets the policy. And I personally believe, no, we don't need to wear beards. We do not need to wear the Afghan uniform. Um, you know, if, if I was to, uh, to support that, then we would be taking off our fragmentation vests and our helmets and everything of this nature. 
we're Canadian soldiers over here to help train the Afghan army. Uh, we're putting ourselves in harm's way to do this. We do not need to strip off all of our personal protective equipment to change our identity uh, because what makes us successful to the start is that we are Canadian soldiers. We're here to mentor them, not to be Afghan soldiers. This is an important patrol as far as the plan to win the people's hearts and minds goes. The Canadians in ANA are finally going to have a shura, or meeting, with the village elders, something they've been trying to arrange for some time. A key step in their counterinsurgency strategy for this area. Zubir takes the lead. Right now he's passing the word that there will be a detainee released tonight at 7.30 at uh, patrol base Patricia. And they've been asking for this detainee for several weeks, so it coincides nicely with the uh, national holiday today. And in the end, it's going to empower the a, a company commander who's just been on the ground for a few days now in the eyes of the people that he's here and positive things are happening in their lives. More security, detainees are being released, uh, some of the restrictions with the searches are being eased back and so they'll come to him with their problems and uh, it'll give him some status in the town. And this town traditionally has been saying that there's no leaders in the town, there's no leaders here when anything goes bad. So our position is that now we have a town leader and it's going to be the a, a company commander for the interim. The patrol isn't the only excitement in the village. There's more to come. They're fucking armed to the teeth. And apparently the villagers are fighting each other right now. So we'll get spooled up and we'll do an IRF thing. Reinches scrambles the immediate reaction force. I didn't hear any shots. I just heard a shot from up top. And uh, basically it sounded like, I don't know, but the ANA guys went pouring out the front gate. So all the commander said was they're fighting in the village right now. Whether it's villager on villager, or whether the Taliban came in after our uh, impromptu shura, something's going on. But my ANA just went running down the road, bare ass with rifles. So where they go, I follow. Ultimately, it's only a minor dispute between villagers, but it's also a reminder of how quickly they need to be ready to respond to a crisis. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and get kitted up. All right. Jesus, the next morning, again. Jared, the American Army major, says his goodbyes. He'll leave Lyon and tell his American commander he's satisfied that Reinches and his soldiers are on the right track, doing what they're doing now. Good to see you. Thanks for coming down. All right. Y'all stay safe down here. Oh, yeah. You too. But hours later, things are going to change. Without warning, a new ANA company commander arrives at Lyon. <laughs> Lieutenant Zabir, who's established strong relations with the Canadians and reassure the villagers of the army's commitment to them is suddenly demoted. The actual company commander just rolled in unannounced, right out of the blue, uh, two and a half hours before the big shura. Captain Mobin is the new company commander. His arrival is low key, and he seems to have more in common with the more polished and sophisticated Lieutenant Gull than with the Canadian's favorite officer, Lieutenant Zabir. Uh, if he falls into sync and follows what we've got set up, we're, we're laughing. Um, if things want to change, then I'm going to have to go back and forth to Shoja and uh, renegotiate with uh, the biospace commander, and uh, we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us for the next few days again. And in the back of my mind, I'm questioning, <laughs> can, I, can I go through another 10 days like the last 10 days? <laughs> uh, we'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. I was really looking forward to having a good wash and a bit of a rest before the sure and no, back to work. The long-anticipated shura is held in the mosque at Lyon. Half a dozen village elders come to meet with the military, and this opportunity to connect with villagers makes it a magnet, attracting other Canadians. Captain Leslie Kirkhoff acts as the senior Canadian responsible for the area around Nakone. As you saw last night, people who are innocent, the process will, will take care of them and bring them back to the community. The elders are agitated from the very beginning because another man has just been taken into custody, right before the shura began. The elders of the village of Nakone are displeased with the taking of an individual uh, member's son as a, as a detainee. 
which has been a, an issue in this village for as long as we've been here since May. And uh, that's pretty well what they're really upset. And they say that we're not respecting them if we, if we don't take their word that every single detainee that we take is innocent. He tested positive for explosives. He was uh, not so much lying, but not telling full truths, as well as uh, he had uh, Taliban propaganda on his cell phone. As in previous cases like this, the elders insist he is innocent and they demand his release. This refrain is frustrating for the Canadians. It is unfortunate that only detainees are the subjects that we have to talk about. Why don't we talk about the security of the village? Why don't we talk about helping each other? We talk about the ANA and ISAF and the locals helping each other to ferret out the insurgency, to make this place safer. Why is the subject always about detainees? Despite his recent demotion, Lieutenant Zabir handles this delicate situation for the ANA. Because Captain Mobin has just arrived, he's chosen not to attend this shura, leaving negotiations to his subordinates. At one point, Zabir even gives his cell phone number to an elder. When the shura breaks up, the Canadians continue to engage select elders. I'd like to add that we are not receiving respect in return. We try to respect you. Have I ever lied to you? Ultimately, the shura seems to accomplish little. I like to talk to them about being partners in this and us help, helping them and them helping us so that we can all work together and everyone would be safe. But they're more interested in saying that everyone's innocent even when they're not. The next morning, Zabir's replacement is on parade with his soldiers, clearly taking command. But Captain Mobin and Captain Reinches won't have much chance to get acquainted because they're pulled in different directions for most of the day. This is... Uh, Could you not go back to the hospital and check on They went back to him and they said it wasn't the guy on the thing. It was the guy on the poster, but it was a local dude. But he Reinches, for example, is busy showing his visiting boss the camp layout and discussing pressing issues. He also gets some advice. You guys are doing a great job here. I know you have a lot to do, but the problem is you don't burn yourselves out because when the second company comes in, you're doing it all again. And then you're going to be running with two companies for the next four months. Beautiful. You can't run like you are right now. Wait, four months? Four more months. We've got new rip days, didn't we? The same day he's being told to change gears, his subordinates learn the Afghans are cutting back on their training courses and patrolling. It's the middle of Ramadan, the holy month for Muslims. During the day, the ANA do not eat or even drink water, even though the temperatures remain above 40 Celsius. Due to the language barrier, it's not clear who gave the order to severely restrict daytime patrols, Captain Mobin or his superiors. Without the Afghans, this will put even more pressure on Lieutenant McDonald's platoon and may even endanger them further. When we go out with uh, just Canadians, we, uh, we're handicapped because we can't uh, read the people like the a and while they wait for Reinches to return from another base, McDonald and Chambers discuss alternate solutions, how to proceed. All of them say the exact same thing. They're not doing it. After Ramadan, they'll do everything we ask them to, but until that happens, until the end of When Reinches gets back and he hears what's happened, he's furious. He wants to go over the head of the new ANA commander immediately. All his built-up frustration and fatigue pour out. You know what? This is too easy. We have a Canada commander now. He's coming in two days from now. Our commander's here. I'm getting on the horn. I'm going to let him know what's going on, and we'll let the pressure come from the top down. So we don't have to pressure him here. I'll just say, hey, what well, are you going to commit let's to? Try, let's try a soft touch today. I can talk to, for four hours in a row and get nowhere. Maybe. But I am obligated to let Captain Snook know, which is exactly what I'm going to do right now, and then he can get on the phone and get across to the brigade commander, and it will come down from the top. It's a lot easier for me to negotiate with this guy if he's getting pressure from his boss, which is exactly what's going to happen. And you can prevent it from going higher. Nope. And no, I'm not obligated to prevent it. You're not obligated, but you soft no. sell it first. You nope. can't soft sell it, then you go higher. I've been soft selling for 10 days now. I've been soft selling for 10 days. To the wrong guy. To the commander. And to, you know what? I'm not going to discuss it. That's exactly what I'm going to do because that's what we're supposed to do. I'm not going to protect no, him and not, not go higher. Yeah. No, it's not what we're supposed to. You know so. what? I'm not, it's not a discussion. That's exactly what's going to happen. I know it's exactly what's going to happen. It's always exactly what's going to happen. 
So you know what I'm gonna do? What are we gonna stand firm and say you yes you are? No, you say no. this it's, is the c command. It's not a command. We don't okay. command them. I'm simply gonna pass it up to my boss and let his boss command them. All right, That's you know how what, it works. I, I, I will stick to Sergeant Major type stuff now. Thank you. Because uh, thank you. I'm how do you think it works? I know. How do you think it works? It works like this. You're his mentor and liaison. Exactly. You mentor him On and you liaison points, with him. But I don't make him patrol. Uh, I don't force him to patrol. No, absolutely so not. So now I report to my you higher. You present him with options. You ask him why. You get all the information. You present him with options. If he chooses your options, great, problem solved. If he doesn't, you go higher. If you go higher before presenting the options to him, that's how it works. And and it comes down to him that you went above him. You will not have a working relationship with him for the rest then of our time. Then we go above here. him all the time and let his command push down. Then you know there's what? no reason for us to be here at that point. For everything we're doing, we clearly are not getting through. He shows up one day and shuts everything off. Shuts off the course, shuts off the patrolling. For what? What are they? Why? Explain to me why. All right, we'll, we'll sell that. Eventually, Reinches calms down as he gets more details, including Mobin's pledge to take up the slack after the month of Ramadan is over. When Ramadan's over, we will do anything you want us to do. All right, cool. So all right, he, all right, I think right. he's open to it. I think the one above him is going to ruin this okay. relationship. All right. No, no, I agree. In this case, engagement was successful. The spotter was wounded. The next priority is to work out a new patrol schedule between Canadians and Afghans, one that doesn't exhaust either group. As well, the omelet will soon have to start again, mentoring a second company, a whole new group of strangers. Today's been a long day, a uh, disappointing day. Again, we've made great bounds forward and small steps back, and today was the day where we, we took a great step backwards. So we need to get some ground rules established here. We need to get a new patrol schedule going, and we need to uh, get through Ramadan and we'll go from there. We gotta fix this thing. We need to win. We need to win tomorrow. The following morning, instead of patrolling, some ANA gather around the well and wash their trucks prior to driving into Kandahar to buy fresh food. They thoroughly clean the smallest details, from the weapons mounts to the hubcaps. Canadians can't help noticing that the ANA have the energy for this, but not patrolling. I just need to talk to your commander. You, is he back yet? No? Yes. He's back? Yeah. Okay, I better go talk to him. All right, put this on pause. Yes. Captain Reinches finally has a lengthy discussion with his opposite number in Mobin's quarters. At one point, Mobin says he has a medical condition that precludes him from wearing body armor. I think you know, it is very important, especially that we should, that in the military, that we should put every staff, you know, body armor, a helmet like this. But unfortunately, I have like this problem. I cannot do it. He's the commander. He's surrounded by strong soldiers. I think he'll be okay. It seems to go well, as well as it can, speaking through an interpreter. And then something happens to thrust Canadians and Afghans much closer together than conversation ever can. What happened? Not sure at this point. IED, RPG went out short. Doc! Someone has detonated an IED within 100 meters of the outpost. It explodes like a large shotgun shell. A five-man resupply patrol returning from Cop Patricia is blasted with fragments of flying metal and glass marbles. No one leaves the fucking current position. What do you need is work. Is that helmet the trial or is that his? Hold there. Two Canadian soldiers from Lieutenant McDonald's platoon lie wounded. Corporal Grant Miller and Corporal Brian Pinkson. Fives and twenties, guys. This place hasn't entirely been cleared yet. Put your hand on my brother. There you go. In all, it takes nine minutes to load both casualties into the ANA ambulance. It drives them to patrol base Shoja, where they are stabilized by a medical team. Then a helicopter takes them to Kandahar Airfield. Total time from IED strike to surgery, one hour and 11 minutes. Go back to search and every fucking swinging dick that comes through. This is the first time soldiers stationed at Lyon have been targeted in such an attack. 
They are frustrated and some want vengeance. Warrant Officer Crocker is quick to brief his soldiers on their friend's condition. Dr. Miller, I strapped no air. Air. Pinky finger is fucking fractured. And there's a couple more spots. He's fucking, he's talking and everything. He's fucking good to go. Fucking pink's in his fucking trap hole right here. There he's, he's in a lot of pain. Fucking bit white, but fucking the spirit is still up. So we told him fucking two minutes to eat ice cream, he'd be okay. Talking, everything. Oh yeah, he's good. talking to us. Yeah. Corporal Kashif Dar was driving the gator behind the two soldiers who were wounded. When the ID went off, I heard Essentially, they're just zooms. It just whipped by. Everything was quick. Uh, one of the gators, like the way I drive, I stick my leg out, and then the shrapnel came on an angle, and then literally it just pinged off and just missed my knee by maybe a few centimeters. Missed my whole leg by a few inches. Um, one piece of shrapnel came in, and I'm astonished, but somehow a John Deere trailer uh, stopped the metal stuff, the uh, other shrapnel ball, you can see where the indent is. Uh, one piece came into my uh, MVG mount with my head back, and uh, that's about it. Um, first reaction to the injuries, they didn't look that bad. Uh, the one guy did have a tourniquet on his lower leg, but the bleeding was controlled, so that was good. Uh, the other guy had abdominal wounds, which didn't look very deep. There was no protruding organs, nothing like that. So it didn't look bad, but apparently he did have a femoral bleed. So that's uh, something you gotta watch out for. Soon after the attack, he and others are quick to discuss any telltale signs or combat indicators that might have tipped them off to the ambush. Like the behavior of the man who lives at the corner where it took place. That guy, he, he, took a, a, he knew something. Because him and all of his kids were at that OP and his door was locked. Why don't we fucking go search his fucking That's and no. Like his. Because where he is, everyone knows where his house is, right? For the first time, him and fucking like six, seven kids were all at the OP. It's never like that. They're all, they're all hanging out there, and his kids were walking down the road, and he was just like, no, come, come. And then we were trying to give him water and shit. So he, for sure, he knows something. He was either too scared to tell us because of what's gonna happen to him, or fucking, there. I don't not see him knowing what happened. It's right in front of his fucking house. Go over and uh, <laughs> tell the CP, contact the OP, and that fuck doesn't come within fucking five feet of that OP. Subsex Alpha, Roger, reference uh, the ANAM. Uh, keep that outside of the blast site, as well, uh, in reference to uh, 42 Bravo, no one is to uh, go through the blast site over. Inside the command post, the officers also review what happened. Lieutenant Zabir and Captain Mobin were among the first soldiers on the scene after the explosion. We see the people who put ID there. There's remote control. Yeah. Looks like a wire. No wire. We see the wire. Where is the who? I think it's electricity. We'll find out. For a week, soldiers from Lion have continuously patrolled Route Chimo to deter bombers. This attack, virtually right outside their front gate, causes them to rethink their tactics. All we're doing is walking back and forth, waiting for something like that to happen. They just, they just prove that they can do it. Yeah. We need engineer assets. Lieutenant McDonald says he will contact the acting Canadian company commander, Captain Kirkhoff, immediately. I'm going to go talk to call sign two now. Just let her know my intent about, about our patrols. I, we're not, I'm seeing some patrols right now. We're not going out there right now without the engineer assets. Right now we're patrolling without en engineers, without lightweight metal detectors. We're patrolling like tan canaries. So I think that uh, the ALT and I got to go up top and have a chat and find a different solution to this. As soon as she hears these concerns, the company commander moves quickly from her patrol base to Lyon. A combined Canadian-Afghan patrol goes to the home of the suspected bomber. Actually, we did a soft knock with the ANA leading. They, uh, they approached the compound and uh, 
and requested entry and were, were permitted in. We uh, provided the outer recorder for the ANA to go in and uh, ask about a person of interest. He wasn't there. We then moved on, talked to some more locals, and, uh, and that was it. Later, she and others discussed Corporal Brian Pinkson's close call and how his belt of 40 millimeter grenades deflected some of the IED fragments. He wears a belt of these, yeah, right there. And these were the two sitting there. Okay, I'll, I'll take those back up. The junk. Late that night, Lieutenant McDonald and Captain Reinches consider how to make their camp more secure. I'll show you a couple of things that I discovered out there. You should know of. Each spot we've had IED hits, traditionally in this town, there's a fucking hole that big in a wall somewhere nearby that Buddy looks at. It's about 25 meters away, which is probably the range of his, whatever he's using to shape your legs. McDonald wants to remove any obvious obstacles to observation, like trees and especially the marijuana field across from their front gate. I just started checking around places where they could get to us, where they would not be able to see us. And there is a, a, a marijuana field just out, out the gate, approximately about five meters, where they can sneak through that and they can place something hastily, as we just seen, right under our nose, and the tower wouldn't see it. He says there's a local agreement in place to allow the farmers to harvest the crop so he can't destroy it. But he can use razor wire to seal it off. That happens the next day. In addition to these changes, soldiers at Lyon get new information on suspected insurgents in the town. They also get engineer support with lightweight mine detectors and a bomb sniffing dog and some secret equipment that can't be shown. The ANA also agree to do more combined patrols in spite of Ramadan. Uh, as soon as Ramadan's over, they say we're going to go 724, no problems. But again, they have restrictions. And from what I understand is most of them are working 4 in the morning till 10 a.m. That's their work day. And nothing outside of that, that's their order. So these guys are going way beyond for us. So just a day after the attack, the mood shifts from feelings of anger and helplessness back to determination and confidence. Things have been looking up tenfold from yesterday. Uh, we got personnel, we got A and A inside. We're getting engineers to help us out. We got a dog team. Uh, tactical infrastructure is uh, coming along. So uh, we're looking a lot better right now. But just as things are getting better, the soldiers suffer another blow to their morale. One week after the IED attack, Corporal Brian Pinkson dies of his injuries at the military hospital in Landstuhl, Germany. The guys were upset. We actually had the news the night before that his leg had been removed. What we understood was it was a blood clot during surgery, it went to his heart, it stopped his heart. It's frustrating because he was talking when just before he left, Patricia, he was talking to everybody and he was in positive spirits. So I think it was a bit of a surprise, a bit of a shock. Brian Pinkson's death won't be the last tragedy to strike his platoon. I had a funny feeling he was going to get blown up. I had a funny feeling, not by any fault of his own, but just he, uh, he was so concerned about everything and he was so concerned about his troops and I thought, yeah, at least something's going to happen. Just one week after Corporal Brian Pinkson's death, the Taliban detonate another IED in Nakone. This time, three Canadians and two children are wounded. They were uh, on their very last patrol. 4-2 actual was out. That was uh, Lieutenant McDonald. They were 30 meters maybe from the front door of the camp. And they were passing uh, a, a fighting patrol from 2-3, which was about 25 people that were heading south on Garbage Alley. And they were being trailed by a guy riding a donkey that we'd searched pretty much every day in the town. And 4-2's patrol was coming north and intercepted the donkey and Derek was gonna go up and do the daily search and he detonated himself. And Derek, I guess, talked to someone else and said that he saw him reach and, and detonate himself as he was just about to start the search. Uh, unfortunately for Derek, it was, uh, the bomb was on the uh, left side of the donkey and I think he was standing on the right side and the donkey took most of it. All we found was the rear legs, front legs and the head. Uh, that was all we found of the donkey and all we found of the bomber was his left leg below the uh, knee, his hat and his one sandal. So uh, that was it, it could have been a lot worse. All three of the wounded soldiers were sent home to Canada to recover from their injuries.
The donkey bomb is just one of several deadly incidents in the past month. Intense firefights and a sniper attack on an interpreter talking on his cell phone like these soldiers are doing. An IED ambush kills the driver of the ANA's water truck. But these are the kinds of details the omelet commander says soldiers can't afford to dwell on. Yeah. I, I cannot concern myself on uh, moment to moment with that. I know what the danger is out there. Um, but if I let it, uh, let it uh, bother me, it would consume me. And uh, I'd be ineffective in, uh, in my job, as with many of the soldiers out there. If you want to go to you can go Still, such a string of close calls has soldiers in the team clinging to newfound superstitions. Superstitious? Absolutely. Uh, Dar has refused to wash his out-of-the-wire shirt. Adam has a mustache he's keeping until uh, he gets on the airplane. Uh, they all got their little, little things that they uh, consider their good luck charms. Uh, right now I'm carrying uh, some poker chips in my pocket that I've been carrying uh, pretty much since I discovered them. And uh, they're going with me all the way to Vegas, so I got to make it out of here. So that's, I guess we all have our little good luck charms. Right now, they're changing camps, ferrying loads from Lyon to their new home at Shikari. It's out in the open and not as isolated. Chambers says his working relationship with Reinches remains solid in spite of their occasional disagreements. Pete and I have our moments. But uh, for the most part, it's a quick flash fire and then it's out. Uh, ultimately, he's the commander. I'm his 2IC, so I will make sure that his will is uh, carried out. But, uh, you know, it's good. We have a good relationship still. The ANA company from Lion is also moving to Shikari, swapping locations with another company. Watching them pack up reminds Corporal Mike Bradbury of similar rituals back home. Probably the roommate moving out. You have to do that uh, awkward stuff exchange, you know. Oh, sorry, I borrowed this without telling you. <laughs> um, you know, that kind of thing. But Lieutenant Zabir won't be moving with them. He's already gone, seemingly a victim of Afghan army politics. Zabir was fired for allegations of gambling, drug use, and theft. And I didn't see any of that. In my time, I found him to be a very competent leader and, and commander. And uh, I had a good relationship with him. I was very disappointed. The mood in the camp was, was solemn for a few days afterwards, and I, I still miss him. I worry for him. I don't know what he's going to do, and I certainly hope he doesn't go to the Taliban, because he was very skilled, and I would hate to have to fight him. In spite of all that's happened, Reinches says he remains committed to the challenge of mentoring Afghan soldiers. Like a pit bull on a, on a bone, I won't let go. It would have been easy to shut down and turn the population off and, and bunker down, but that's not why we're here. And I still believe that a majority of the people of Nakane want to have the things that we offer. And it's still the small holdout that are leaning towards the insurgency and, of course, the Taliban that are in town. So I still think it's us against them and that the, there are a lot of innocent people caught in the middle. And, you know, I hold on to that and I still try to uh, be positive about it and still try to push the message that we're, that we're there to help them. When he and his team arrived in Afghanistan, company mentors were a thing of the past. Now they seem the way of the future, a means of improving the ANA from the ground up. But for now, Reinches and his soldiers keep their focus on more immediate concerns, not daring to look too far in the future. One day at a time, you can't afford to here. And you know that as well as I do that, you know, I'm thinking about getting back to Patricia tonight in one piece and then we'll see if we can make it through the night and then we'll start tomorrow with a new day and we'll go from there. But uh, I'm not allowed the luxury of thinking two months down. Uh, I'm not worrying about that yet. It's hard to leave these soldiers when I do. For a brief time, they've welcomed and protected me like one of their own. And now that I'm moving on, it feels like I'm abandoning them to two more months of danger and an uncertain fate.